Welcome to Bite-Sized Agency Briefs, a webinar series that packs a ton of important agency information on one topic from one expert into a 25-minute brief. Why 25 minutes? Because who has the attention span for much more these days? And you can squeeze in a listen between meetings with time for a bathroom break or coffee refill before your next meeting. Thanks for tuning in. This is Bite Sized Agency Briefs. I'm your host, Steve Guberman from Agency Outsight, where I coach agency owners to build the agency of their dreams. I'm really excited to be here with Carl Smith from Bureau of Digital. Uh, who personally, this is kind of creepy, but uh, may have been a slight fanboy of for, for quite a while before we met in the past year or so. Um, but Carl had a web agency during, I think, during the heyday of web standards and transitioned from running a team of really talented web guys and gals uh, to now he runs what I think could easily be called one of the best, if not the best, uh, community for agency owners and, and people in the agency space. So uh, Carl is is the epitome of a community catalyst. So thank you for joining me. I'm grateful for your time. How are you doing today? I'm good. And and thank you, Steve, for that amazing intro. I think we should just make that the whole show. Tell people goodbye. I'll send this to my mom. We're going to be solid. <laughs> mom um, will hang no, it on I'm, the fridge. Yeah. I'm excited to be here because if there's one thing I'm passionate about, it's people who run shops and the things they create and all of that. So I know we probably only have seven hours, so I'll, I'll try to keep it concise. We'll, we'll do a three-parter, seven hours each. It'll be great. Um, so Engine, uh, it was just Engine, right? Not Engine Works, right? Um, yeah, it was Engine Works, but we called it Engine. Okay, so that that started up. You ran that for a bunch of years. What was kind of the uh, trajectory and, and, I guess, eventual exit from that like for you? Yeah. So I started, I'd been in advertising for about 14 years and 12 years in, um, I got married and we had a kid. We got pregnant on the honeymoon. Timing was just <laughs> as <ready>. one does. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, when my youngest, uh, was almost a year old, we found out we were pregnant again and I was working 50 hours, 60 hour weeks at this agency. I had been asked to take it over. And uh, I just said, no, I was like, I can't do that. And so at that point, I decided to spin up my own thing. Uh, it was actually my wife, uh, Kathy. I came home one day, I was really frustrated. Um, I had found out some stuff about the agency I was working at, and we were having a layoff, but some money was going to buying a building. And I was just like, I hate it. Um, and when I got home and I was so frustrated, uh, she went to a bookshelf and pulled off uh, a business plan that I had. I used to use do business plans as a catharsis. Okay. And, and she pulled one off and she goes, I don't care which one, just do one of these. You've got four years until the kids know we're poor. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. Wow. So amazing I, support I there. My huh? shop. Yeah. So I, I started engine and, uh, it, you know, I love the name because it was, it was next generation. It was ingenious. It was all these fun things we could do with it. Uh, we had a sprocket for a logo as a lot of people did. Um, but, but it was one of those things where I never realized until I started my own shop, all the things my boss had done right, but I never gave her credit for. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you but, kind of um, take for granted as an employee of, oh, they're just not doing this and they're not doing that, but you don't see the things they're doing behind the scenes as yeah. owners until you jump into that seat. Right. So lessons learned hindsight being what they were. How did that guide what you did with Engine? Yeah, so the first part was um, about six weeks in, I actually had lunch with her, Melanie. And I just said, I'm sorry. And she goes, it's okay. She goes, you know, nobody knows what to do when there's nobody left to blame. Hmm. And that's where you are now. There's nobody left to blame. You are going to be in charge. And I never let that escape my brain, that this was on me. The things I learned leaving, though, were... Like we had a very simple initial plan. We weren't going to, no matter how successful we got, we weren't going to recreate Valhalla. Like we were going to mm -hmm. have Ikea furniture and we were going to be playing on last gen consoles. <laughs> and, you know, we were going to be drinking good beer though. Like we were not going to skimp on that shit. We, we fully bought into that bro culture at the time. Um, today I would never do it like that. But at the time yeah. it was like absolutely where we were. And, uh, and you know, our thing was, we just wanted to be 
talented and irreverent. We told we would tell uh, prospects when they first came in, if you don't want to work with somebody who's going to tell you no when you're wrong, then don't hire us. Nice. Yeah. Right? And that, that worked really well. We also, we had very low overhead or low overhead as we used to call it. And I had money, my partners didn't. Um, and so I just said, I'll, I'll, I'll fund this for a couple of years then I'll pay myself back. And it mostly worked, but out of the gate, we landed Chase. Um, and this was, I signed a, a voluntary non-compete with the, with the agency because I was cocky, not because I was a good person. I was like, mm -hmm. I don't need you shit. Um, and then we landed Chase and we were doing national, we were a flash shop. So we're doing national uh, trade show graphics for them. I Wait, hold on. So Sorry. for all the youngsters out there, Flash, <laughs> is, Flash was, Flash is now dead. Flash was like Adobe's premier web dev tool mm. that was essentially a vector-based programmable, mm. vector-based animation program. Yep. And it's now dead. Thank you, Apple. So yeah, we, Flash Shop. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, Macromedia um, got acquired by Adobe. And at that time, it, it was like this thing where there were two thoughts on the web. One, build it so anybody can find anything and do something. Two, knock their socks off. Yeah. And so we ended up in that knock their socks off category until our first employee who came in and had taught himself standards because he was bored. Right. And he was amazing. He actually is the, I think he's the lead designer for Square now, but I'm not positive. Okay. We haven't talked for a while, but we got in there and our whole thing was just about, we want to create things that are different. We didn't know a lot about usability. We didn't know a lot about the things we know now. Mm -hmm. Standards was just coming into fruition. Um, but we, we did great work. And that's what we always said. If we answer the phone and we keep our word, we're going to be fine. Yeah. Just do great stuff. So Engine lasted for the better part of 14 years. Um, we went distributed in 2008. I bought out my partners and we grew to about 40 folks. We were in eight time zones, I think four countries. And wow. we, were, we were doing work for uh, big financial institutions like Macquarie in uh, Australia. We were doing work with um, fantasy sports groups who I might still have an NDA, but I think the game's on CBS. Anyway, um, so, so that was it. And we were having a lot of fun. Then we got to a point where we actually inverted uh, our business model and had clients pitch us. Hmm. Now, this was the beginning of rapid growth for us because, and you you know me pretty well, Steve, I, I don't like to be in charge. I want to see things happen, but I want it to be a group effort. I want us all to do it. I don't want to dictate anything. And what we did was let the team select the work they wanted to work on. What was amazing about this was when we put this in place, we actually turned into like three different shops, right? And I don't use the word agency too much because I don't think we were like that. I think we were definitely more of a shop. Yep. And we ended up with one group that was crazy about organic and whole foods. Another group that really wanted to get in on big data and fantasy sports and that stuff. And then a group that just loved the old school web. They just wanted to build mom and pop restaurant websites and they just wanted to create really beautiful and easy experiences. And so we ran like that for a while. And that's when the Bureau started around 2012. Um, and at that point, I kind of stopped running my shop. I just walked away and started thinking about all the other things I could do. Some of the people in the community, uh, Matthew Oliphant, uh, he was with me at Engine, and then uh, let's see, Travis and Rachel Gertz were at Engine. Mm -hmm. Lori was there. There's a lot of people sprinkled throughout, and and it was really just a magical kind of hot mess. Some people thought we were called at one point the People's Republic of Engine. Um, <laughs> we're also known as uh, the Lord of the Flies in terms of the way that we had salary transparency and that sort of stuff. But were each the, of these three silos kind of running on their own with? biz dev, account management, project management. So they were kind of siloed as their own little shops within a bigger shop, right? Kind of. You know, we never right. looked at it that way, but it, but it was definitely those teams. And the, the thing that I always thought was so magical about it was we had a core team of about eight folks. We had about 40-ish, maybe 45, everybody. But that core team, anyone on that core team could select a project, if they wanted to work on it, they just had to get the support of one other person on the core team and be able 
to get an uh, external team to enjoy it. We actually called it, uh, if you were in the inner circle, you were an engineer because we were engine, but that next circle was friend, friend engineer. So these were folks who were kind of like and, and dedicated contractors, which uh, Gabe Levine always rolls his eyes. He goes, you call them permalancers. Don't ever <laughs> do that. I'm like, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Um, but yeah, so we, they basically could take the projects and they just finished up the teams with whoever was there that wanted mm -hmm. to do the work. And, and it was great. Now, eventually a lack of biz dev is what took us down. We had, um, we were one of seven shops that could work for Facebook. Like we were working on their internal stuff and we fired them. Wow. You know, well, it just, they changed people on us and, and it became jackasses. And that was the thing. It's like eventually because we only wanted to work with who we wanted to work with mm -hmm. and we didn't reload enough. Uh, it just kind of fell apart. Yeah. You know, sucks. <laughs> I think when an agency gets to a point where they get to fire people, that's kind of like the bar mitzvah of agencies yeah. where, you know, what, we, we've got pipeline, we've got revenue, we've got confidence, we can get more business. We don't need to work with people that don't align with our values or whose products or services don't align with our values or just don't treat our team properly. And exactly. so, yeah, I commend that. And when an agency gets to that point, I think it's a really special point. I remember the first time so there's two times once I wanted to fire my brother a few times because he was one of our clients. <laughs> And he's, he's to this day, such a pain in the butt, but there was another client that just didn't treat my, my head account manager properly. And finally, we also let them go. We said, this isn't a good fit. We can recommend a few agencies, but I don't really appreciate the way you treat our team. And it felt good. I mean, that, that earned me miles of cred with my team. They knew I would fall on the sword for them. They knew I would risk, are we going to make payroll or like those kinds of things in order to support the community. So yeah, I fully get that. Well, so, and one of the things when you're, when you're saying that, sorry, um, but we used to call it can, uh, can the client, mm -hmm. like it's, it's time to can the client. Like the culture is really bad right now. What is weighing us down? What is not what's happening here? And, and when you did that, it was like a relief valve. Yeah. And people did realize that you were paying attention and that you, you did care more about them than money or whatever. But what I will say really opened the eyes for everybody. And the only reason we were able to, it was called the jellyfish model, have people actually pitch the team was because the team understood the finances. Hmm. So they understood the context. So if, if I said we have $300,000 in the bank and you don't know what a monthly expense is, you'll be like, let's hit Vegas, right? <laughs> but if I have 300,000 in the bank, but if I say, well, we've got about 10 months of expenses. You're like, let's take that little mom and pop's restaurant down the street because God, we need the money. Yeah. You know, so that was a big lesson for me. Context was everything. So it all also kind of drilled in a scarcity model to them on some sense that they weren't really running the agency or leading it. And so they weren't responsible for it, but they could be aware of it and understand the decisions they make affects the greater sum, you know, the sum of the whole. Absolutely. Why jellyfish? Uh, so for a lot of reasons, and I give Rachel Gertz uh, all the credit for calling it the jellyfish model. Um, so jellyfish come together when there's a problem. They're like the ocean's vacuum cleaners. Mm -hmm. They come together when there's a problem. They grow to the size they need to, to solve it. Right. And then they solve the problem. Now they die after that, which we didn't do. And also we didn't grow the way that they grow. Right. Like we were like a couple of times, but anyway, yeah. not important. Um, but so that was the main thing. Also, they're transparent, translucent, mm -hmm. um, and no creature that I'm aware of has done a better job of sustaining its life, right? Mm. They've been around for thousands of years. They live in the hottest oceans, the coldest waters. They live in salt water. They live in fresh water. Um, they're just everywhere. So that was really it. And, and the other thing that was great is a group of jellyfish is called a smack. So when we would get a new opportunity, a message would go in base camp called smack attack. And I would tell the client, I would be like, or the prospect, I'd be like, look, I'm going to put one paragraph in this message to see if anybody wants to take your project. Now, here's the thing. I know this sounds like we're being really difficult, but do you want people to work with you who said, yes, I want to do this? Or do you want people who are going to work with you because they were told they have to do this? Wow. Because my yeah. team, if they choose you, they are going to go to the ninth degree for you. They are going to do everything they can because this is a commitment they made. 
but if it was another folder dropped on four folders, you're going to get yeah. what you get. Wow, man, that is huge. I mean, I, I would go so far as to you know, get the team together a couple times a year and say, what kind of clients do we want or who are actual brands we want to chase? Or, you know, we would do the whole X, Y axis of clients we've won that are profitable that we enjoy doing. And if they end up in this matrix, let's chase that kind of stuff. But you took it to, literally to the nth degree of saying, if my team wants you, we're going to choose you. And if not, sorry, go find somebody else. Wow. Yeah, we had, cool. um, it was amazing. And it also changed the types of clients really quickly. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a big opportunity with Microsoft that we didn't get because they weren't going to play our hippie bullshit game. Right. <laughs> but what they did was go to our website and cherry pick the people they knew would be on the project. Hmm. So it was another one of the things that we did when somebody came on the team the last interview they would have was with me. First, all of our team would always let us know. We had a running list of folks they wanted to work with. So every Friday, I would reach out to some people on the list. We call them the Army of Awesome. And I'd reach out to the Army of Awesome, and I would say, hey, our team is really impressed with you because you did this. And they would love to just have a conversation. And I'm curious if you'd ever want to work with us, what would that look like? What kind of money would you need? What kind of time would you be willing to put in per week? That kind of thing. But we never did it when we were under pressure. Right. We always are talking to people just in a casual way. They get to meet people. So the team would hire the team. Right. And then that way they're loyal to the people who love them and brought them on versus once again, it being a money thing. And then I would always say, look, this is the range that the team makes. Right. These are senior designers. They're making 80 to 100,000, um, depending on their skill sets and different things. So you'll be in that range. I can't tell you where, uh, but that's what we can do. And if you need more than that, that's great. It's not going to happen here. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't made that much before, that's great. It would happen here because everybody wants to feel good. They, they want to know extrinsically everyone's taken care of, right? That everybody's yeah. feeling good. But th the other part of that um, that was great was when I would have that interview with them, I would always say, look, I don't expect you to be here forever. My job is to make sure you leave for a really good reason. Yeah. And when that Microsoft thing happened, I remember I had uh, four of the people on the team came to me and said, hey, Microsoft, I just wanted you to know. Well, I said, are you interested? Three of them said, no, God, no. I was like, all right, cool. But the fourth one <laughs> who's a really, really good person, a good friend of mine today in the community, all that stuff, said they offered me $120 an hour as an individual. Yeah. And I was like, go get it. Yeah. Call me in four months when you realize what you've done, but send me a nice gift, like not a bottle of wine, like a freaking <laughs> Ames chair, right? Like send me something that's got a comma in the cost and then we can talk again. But, um, but so that was another thing. It's like realizing that nobody's dream is going to align with your dream, but up into the distance at some point it comes together. Yeah. So if you can move forward at that pace together, with excitement and energy and know that one day you're going to move on. I always felt that was a really, really powerful way to start a relationship. Yeah. I was taught, you know, build people up and lead them in a way that they're going to, that they have the ability and can maybe be poached, but to treat them in a way that they don't want to leave. And it sounds like, yeah. you know, that's kind of how you cultivated your team or the team cultivated themselves. But so, so you ran the agency much like a community fast forward, yep. Now you actually run a community and take those same values into Bureau of Digital. What was that transition out of the agency into running Bureau of Digital full time like for you? I was, it took a while. Um, I was a serial attendee at the Bureau stuff because the company was doing well and I wasn't really doing anything. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds horrible and lazy now, but I was really proud of it. Um, but then, so I was talking a lot. I was, uh, you know, traveling, speaking, all these things. I uh, got invited to the first bureau event put on by Greg Story and Greg Hoy mm -hmm. and just fell in love, right? It was like 24 people sharing real stuff, helping each other out. Um, and then that started to grow. And around 2015, uh, I started just doing other things like lead share networks and stuff like that. And they reached out and said, hey, do you want to come over here and uh, do that here? Because we were going to do it. We're not getting to it we're kind of in the same community. So it feels like we're going to bump into each other. And I was like, yeah, I would love to do that. So uh, took about a year and a half to get an agreement together, <laughs> which, which is funny. So I won't go into the whole story, but they both ran different companies called happy cog. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and eventually they merge the two happy cogs together. Mm-hmm. It is a whole nother podcast. And, uh, but the, the holding company, because it was Greg Hoy and Greg story, it was Hoy story. Nice. So I only had one requirement when I joined, which was that the name be changed to Hoy story Two. I was like, <laughs> I, have no, I have no, no ego with the last name Smith that I need my name on anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we finally got that done around 2016. Um, Greg Hoy was going to go and try to reboot Happy Cog and, and see what he could do there to sell it. Greg Story had gone on to IBM, where if you ever heard about where they hired 2,000 designers in like four or five months, that was him. Yep. Like he led that whole charge. Uh, and then I took over the, the bureau. And the first thing that I did um, was shift from being an events organization to a community because it was all the time in between the events that it felt like the most happened. Um, and that's what I really wanted was just to, to do that. But yeah, it's amazing. Cause I remember when the first, what was it called owner camp maybe was launched and I was, there was a threshold of either employees or revenue and I was just below it at my agency. And I was like low key resentful, a little annoyed, very full mode and like son of a gun. And I ended up selling the next year. So never ended up making it to any of the in-person events that the Greg's put together that you were involved in. But I remember watching from afar and be like, man, I, I want to get to that. So, so tell me what your, your thoughts are on the value of community for agencies. And, and I'll preface it with this. Um, a lot of agencies, they operate with a fear mindset, with a competitive mindset, with a proprietary mindset. And what you cultivate at Bureau of Digital is a lot of openness, a lot of sharing experiences, the mastermind groups that I run, some of the events that you're incorporating there is all about that as well. Like, tell me about what your experience and the value of that is to agencies. Yeah. So before I sat down at that first event, um, when I started my shop, I contacted probably about 10 other people who I thought would be in that same space in Jacksonville where I live. Mm -hmm. Only one of them agreed to have lunch with me. Mm -hmm. The others kept me at a distance. During the first decade of my company's existence, uh, I got it, towards the end of the 10 years, I got this really nice gift from Harrington Design, who was the shop that got me. And he told me that I had referred a million dollars worth of business, at, at which wow. point I picked up the phone and I was like, this gift doesn't cut it. Like, what are you, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, bring me something nice, man. Um, but no, but uh, so, so for me, that was always a thing, like to reach out, try to find other people. Because in advertising, it's even worse. Mm-hmm. It's like total closed bubble, don't talk to other people. But when we got together at that table, and I think part of it was the Greggs, they just set this tone. And we, we did the Bureau Oath, which just basically says you won't share anything somebody would think is confidential. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just let it out. And none of us had ever really competed against each other. I had been up against one of the shops at the table who happened to be a great friend, right? And so yeah. it was like one of these things where when you compete against each other, if you respect each other, it's different, Yeah. right? But uh, we've never, with very few exceptions, run into a situation where people had an issue with another shop. And when it does happen, I try the best that I can to help the kids figure it out. <laughs> yes. But um, honestly, it, it's such a small percentage of the time. And, and what I would say is the the biggest example of this working is BizDev Camp. Now, I was told for years, don't do anything with BizDev. Hmm. It's not going to work. They're not going to they're not going to share. They're not going to be open. They're going to be everything close to the chest. Before we even got there, they were having calls. These were some of the most held down, mistreated humans, right? Go get us something. What the hell did you bring me? Right. Yeah. And it, it's just, it was one of those things where they were finally among their people. And even today, there's an accountability call that started after the first uh, BizDev camp, which had to be five years ago. And they still meet once a month and they're just sharing with each other what they're trying to accomplish. They're holding each other accountable. They're doing all those things. Um, So I think for agencies, the biggest thing is when somebody comes to the bureau, normally when they join, they're looking for an answer to some problem they haven't been able to figure out. And then they come in and they realize this is really hard. Like running a shop is really hard. It's not that you're bad at it. 
Mm -hmm. It's that it's difficult and you probably didn't go to school for business. Right. And so now you're trying to figure it out. Well, when you get in with a bunch of other people who also are just trying to do their best and they're willing to help you and then you want to help them because outside of, like I said, 5%, 10%, they're generally not butting heads going against right. each other. And when they do, they sometimes put together a package where the company can get both of them. Right. You know, yeah. where they merge. A lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Love it. So as always, 25 minutes flies by, um, but man, so much value in that. Um, before I let you go, any kind of parting piece of wisdom? What's like your greatest piece of business advice you can share for an agency owner? Oh, I would say, and this may sound a little, a little cliche or, or contrite, but you know, the, the reality is don't get too high with the highs and too low with the lows. Um, and, and a lot of us are going through that right now with, with pipelines that can't figure out what they want to do, mm -hmm. but really you only, when you're running your own shop, you only lose when you quit, you know, That's huge. So just yeah. take it easy. You know, it's going to be okay. Ah, I love it. So true. Stay the path, keep working on it. You know, don't quit. Uh, Carl, it's been great to get to know you over the past year or so and become your friend and uh, honored yeah. to be able to call you a friend and be a part of your community. So Thank you for your time today. I really am grateful for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all you do, Steve, and, and for all you're about to do. We're putting you to work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it, man. Thanks. Thanks again for tuning in to Bite Sized Agency Briefs. As always, if you found value in this episode, chances are someone else will too. So please share it with your network. Also, if you know someone with expert knowledge on a topic that agency owners would love, Drop me a note. Let's get them on. Finally, find someone to hug today.